Okay, thank you, John. Uh, please uh, write in and say if you can't hear me. Uh, like John said, uh, uh, you know, we all know the Internet isn't perfect, but uh, they're doing the best they can. I want to congratulate on you on your series, and thank you very much for, for uh, allowing me to participate. Uh, uh, I, I, I listened to the series that was recorded the last couple of times, and I thought it was very informative, uh, so uh, congratulations on that. I'm going to talk for, about four things today, and uh, they they really the first one is the is a about a, a laundry list of items that I think a borrower would want to check to see in when they're choosing a lender and then I'm going to flip the switch and say what does a lender look in a, at a borrower I'm going to talk a little bit about business plans and then I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, successes that we've seen for management practices in in these kind of times. So with that, the first slide I have it has to do with it's really a laundry list of questions, and uh, it's that you can ask yourself. It, keep in mind that every lender is going to be better at some of these and 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 worse at other ones. You have to pick the one that that works for you. I guess I would say of all of the things on the third bullet, it says, uh, do they talk straight to you about your business? And really what I mean there is, are they asking you, are they just nice all the time or are they asking you questions that are a little more difficult and that cause you to think and add value to your operation? And, and to me, uh, if you choose lenders like that, that may not always that may not always uh, ask uh, easy questions, but are straight with you in all of the good times as well as the bad. I think you'll end up with a better operation and a better uh, uh, a better lending relationship. And keep in mind too that I'm talking about long-term relationships in a lending business rather than a transactional, uh, which I I haven't seen Bob's presentation. Uh, Bob Sirens, but I'm looking forward to that. Uh, he may talk more about that part of the of the lending relationship. the The next one has to do with flipping the the page over, and it really has to do with uh, what a bank uh, look what a bank looks at and for a lending relationship with a borrower. And we're look and I'm, again, I'm talking about longer term relationships. These are the basic what what's traditionally known as the five C's of credit and while Dr. Cole uh, 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 talks about they really are collateral, 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 uh, this is really what he's uh, playing off of. It's uh, really uh, capital, capacity, collateral, conditions, and character. And I just want to make a couple of comments about this. The, the first one on the capital really has to do with how much equity uh, a borrower owns and then how much of that is in liquidity. And we've seen in our area uh, in, the last, in the last year uh, and, and especially in the dairy business is how important liquidity really is. A lot of times one would think that there would be certain industries that can get by with less liquidity and dairy being one of them because they their cash flow is monthly rather than rather than maybe perhaps annually on for annual crops but the this time around the dairy business as many of you know are struggling very hard the prices of of milk are way down and i think that some of the dairymen this year are not just going to be the very good dairymen that survive. I think some of the dairymen that will, won't survive are going to be excellent dairymen, but haven't had the liquidity in their operations, and they have no way to get liquidity in their operations, and they're going to flat just run out of cash. So uh, the liquidity component of this is, is uh, and the working capital is extremely important. On the repayment side, uh, for capacity, profitability really is if you make money, and cash flow is really if you made enough money. And those are two different components. Uh, collateral, is, as we all know, is the last resort for repaying the loan. Uh, conditions really have to do with monitoring what is going right with the loan. 
uh, compensating the bank for risk in the loan, and then matching the the terms of the loan with the customer's needs, the cash flow. Uh, character and management, and all, really this one relates a lot to the next several slides I have. And to me, uh, it has a lot more to do with not only if the person is a good person, if they're honest, but it really has a lot to do with how they manage their business and, and how, how they manage their farm and ranch, their business and their skills and their financial skills. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about business plans. And there is a place, and I know some people in our, uh, even our customers that that utilize unwritten business plans, but these or these operations really are limited because business plans are really a way to do a couple of things. They allow for communication with others and other stakeholders. And if you're a single person and don't need to borrow money, uh, and in your operation, you could probably get by with it with a without a written business plan because you've done the business planning in your head and you only have one person to report to and that's you but when uh, when something happens to that person it uh, then the life cycle of the business is cut short so business plans are also uh, good for not only communicating with owners and stockholders and stakeholders but but they can be a a good benchmark for everybody to track uh, agreements on how and where the business is going and how it's going to getting there. Getting there, the strategic plan within the business plan is really setting up what objectives and strategies and actions need to take place in the in the business, and it provides a way to have those objectives and and action steps accountable to others within the business. So that. The business plans and written business plans ex are extremely important. Those companies that have those and those farmers and ranchers that have those do significantly better than those that do not. From from a business plan, from the financial plans perspective, uh, this is really the my wish list of what uh, of what I would expect to see from a very good business plan. And that is, you, not only is the crop or livestock production, you're having your expense and operating budget for showing your profitability. Uh, you have a capital budget showing what is going to, what what uh, capital purchases you're going to make, and probably pro forma projected balance sheets. And the last one that you see more and more now is enterprise tracking. Uh, many of the farms and ranchers today have more than one op uh, more than one operation, and and uh, many more many you're seeing need to understand what those different operations do at what time so they can make the proper de business decisions in a timely manner. And if you don't have the enterprise tracking and identify what the separate uh, businesses do, then it's very difficult to make the decisions in a timely manner and especially in times like this so uh, I think that's a trend that I'm seeing more and more of and and it's a way to improve your business and be a little ahead of the t uh, of the curve uh, the last item on this one I wanted to talk about is really have what can I do to improve my my uh, business skills because to, for the most part, for the most part, these skills are, are learned skills, and uh, you can educate yourself. And and uh, but I think the bottom line is you got to understand where your strengths and weaknesses are, and and build on the strengths and and compensate and offset for the weaknesses you have. Are we all have those? The last. The last part I wanted to talk about is what are the things that we see that businesses and farmers and ranchers do to continue prosperity in the uncertain times. And so I've made a list of 12 things that I've seen uh, operators do in our times. And one of those is they keep a positive relationship with our lender who's committed to the industry. Um, they do keep excellent financial records. Uh, they're better than the than the average. 
they uh, do the enterprise analysis, and uh, whether it's by segment or commodity, and another thing is they look at their staff capabilities. If they're more, if they're more than a family operation, and even if they are family operations, they'll they'll uh, match the people in the family or in the operation to the right place they need to be within the operation. And if you if there's a family member that is very satisfied in in uh, uh, driving tractor, then that's where they ought to be. If they're not skilled in the financial area, you don't want to put them in the bookkeeping area. So it's getting the people in the right seat on the bus and uh, making sure that they can contribute in a positive way. Of course, minimizing costs and expenses. Uh, number six is managing the whole margin. And what I mean by that is that uh, if you look at operations, in the la especially in the last year, you're going to see a lot of operations that had the that did have the opportunity. And this, and some of this is 2020 hindsight, but if you look at, you see you see the people that had the opportunity to lock in both costs and prices on the other side and prices for their commodities, and those that didn't, uh, many of those that didn't are suffering today because what many of them locked in like high corn costs for the feeding operations but did not lock in the the uh, profits for the sales um, dairy farmers locked in some high feed costs but didn't uh, didn't uh, lock in their milk prices and we've seen some people some milk uh, producers that did lock in milk prices that are doing well today so uh, I think there's a more of an emphasis as we go forward about locking in the your your entire gross margin, not just part of that. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, the uh, I've seen in the last uh, year uh, a lot of rents and leases in terms of contracts be renegotiated with suppliers and input people, and uh, more than I have in probably the last 25 years prior to that. And it's because of the changes in operations, uh, the changes in the economy that we see. Uh, the family living expense, uh, we've we've had we've had some uh, very good times in the last couple of decades, and all of a sudden now we're in a situation where uh, we have many, especially young farmers, that have not seen the the real serious downturns in the ag economy and they've grown up used to buying lots of toys and and uh, that part is over in a lot of areas and the the family living adjustments are sometimes I've seen some families that have been able to adjust easily and some of them that haven't but that's one of the things that uh, helps keep more oper money into the operation and uh, be able to uh, work themselves through the downtimes. Number nine is using all the risk tools. I talked a little bit about uh, the hedging of uh, like milk prices and stuff like that. That's uh, but there's also insurance and fixed rates. Uh, if you can get fixed rates, are more difficult to get right now. But if you can get them, now is probably a good time. I mean, there hasn't been any lower prices uh, for for costs that you've that we've seen for years, decades, and decades. Uh, take steps to maintain and increase liquidity and sell assets if necessary. And I talked a little bit about that, but I wanted to, to, to put that on this list because people who've taken, like, uh, who who've feel that there's some very significant risks in the business, I've seen people sell their, their uh, vacation cabins, they sell other assets that are not earning money and put it back into the business and increasing liquidity and increasing their working capital to make it through the bad times. Number 11, take multiple actions sooner to preserve options. And when of, of, the, of the farmers and ranchers that I've seen that have had issues, the, the ones that have succeeded, su have survived and flourished out of that are the ones who have 
have taken multiple uh, steps all at one time and may rather than saying well I'm going to try to put up this piece of property and see if it sells they'll say well I'd, I'd right, like to sell that one first but if that doesn't work I'll sell these other pieces and they'll put them all up for sale and work with what they've got and those that do that uh, are more likely to survive any downturn than those are not. The number 12 is <laughs> is I've seen people in our in our area those that have kept good balance sheets and not borrowed a lot are going out and purchasing land um, at very low prices and and uh, they have efficient they've been having efficient operations and they're actually capturing opportunities at that time so uh, right now so anyway those are the 12 things I saw I, I want to talk uh, in for, from a management perspective, I think there's two basic things. Identify small issues in the operation before they become problems and solve them early. And then uh, use the planning process and the, financial, uh, and the financial statements and enterprise analysis to take advantage of opportunities and identify issues before they become problems. Um, the last one is the last... Uh, uh, marks on that slide are a crisis equals danger and opportunity. That's from a famous speech from John F. Kennedy that referred to the Chinese language where the, the symbol for crisis is, part, has, is a combination of the one from danger and opportunity. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, John, and, and with any questions. Joel. Thank you very much. Um, the first question, um, you, you referenced business plans and, and good records. Um, what do you think the biggest hurdle is in getting producers up to speed with good records? And the second part of that, what aspects of records are borrowing, borrowers having the most difficulty with? Um, the first part of that, I would say that it's a understanding of what the borrowers, what the advantage to the actual owner borrower uh, is. Uh, they, you know, for the most part, they've grown up in this industry and they understand what the operational process is, and they, they still, um, and so they don't see a a huge need to to go out, for example, and pay extra money to get a reviewed statement or to break down the statements into enterprise analysis. And I think they just, if they if they look at it a little bit farther into it and say, what opportunities am I missing if that I don't know have that and that I don't publish my financial statements like monthly or at minimum quarterly and they don't understand that if they look at those and understand what those mean, they can identify issues and before crisis happens. They can correct problems. They can take advantage of opportunities, and there's so many things you can do. As far as what aspects of the records the borrowers are having most difficulty with, um, I think it's the total understanding of of uh, what those what those financial statements can do. We have a vast array in our business of, of people that understand them very, very well and those that don't really understand the difference between a balance sheet and an income statement. So th those are the hurdles that we look at and we struggle with as lenders. Um, kind of a follow-up on that. Uh, how do you train uh, young or beginning farmers in these business skills, financial management business planning skills? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, we have to train our, and, and whether it's us or any financial institution, I think you have to train your loan officers to ask the right questions and be of help to those folks that that are running those operations. That's our lifeblood, and that's what we need to be a success. If they're not successful, we are. So we have to train our loan officers to ask the right questions and help them along with that process and get them to understand the value for that.
uh, how has uh, and Joel, this this will be my my last question. And to the audience, if you could. Uh, concentrate on what we're saying, but also answer the poll questions. That would be great. And Joel, how has information provided by borrowers changed over the past few years? I guess an ad additional part of that is what are you requiring differently? And how do you think that information will change over the next year or three to five years? Uh, what we require for borrowers really has to do with the operation. And and if it is a smaller, uh, if it's a smaller operation, we're going to re require less. If it's a larger, more sophisticated operation that has, uh, for example, three tentacles, or let's suppose uh, what we see now is uh, two brothers being in the farming business, and they go to partners and. It, on a piece, so they have their separate things, and then they have their joint operation, and maybe then uh, por portions of that family branch off and have an agribusiness. So you're starting to get into some real complexities, and for those kind of operations that can become much more complex, we and borrow more money, we require either reviewed or uh, in in some cases audited financial statements. Uh, and I, th I think that's becoming more and more the norm in the in the financial arena. Um, I think those that uh, I th I think those uh, as far as what's going to happen in the future, I I I see that there's going to be more and more tendency to understanding each set of the enterprises more, uh, like I talked about in the slides. I think that's the trend. And I don't think there's going to be any backsliding about there's going to be any ever. I don't think we can expect any any less in terms of adequacy of financial information. I think the requirements for that are going to be increasing as we go along. Thank you, Joel. And uh, there will be an opportunity to, uh, to place more questions before Joel after uh, uh, Corey and uh, Bob have have presented and